On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Curtis Franklin and Mr. Brian Chi here today, and we talk about the next generation of security, and that just might include organizations like the FBI hacking into your systems to ensure your updates are applied. How would you feel about that? We'll talk about that. Plus, Kubernetes doesn't inherently put enterprise issues at the heart of its service, but the industry has responded. And today we have CTO of Replicated, Mark Campbell, take us through the innovation happening around containers, Kubernetes, DevOps, and more. Shouldn't miss it. Why? On the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyat, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 439, recorded April 16th, 2021. Kubernetes on a half shell. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by FlexTrack, the powerful yet simple security management platform that helps you to get the real cybersecurity work done. With FlexTrack, you'll streamline your assessments, analytics, and reporting. Visit FlexTrack.com slash twit and claim your free month. And by Melissa. Like expired milk, 30% of your customers' data goes bad every year. That's money down the drain. Visit Melissa's developer portal for free access to data quality APIs, demos, and code samples. Freshen up your sour data today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. And by Technology Powers X. Learn how technology is reshaping business through an original podcast from Dell Technologies. Search for Technology Powers X anywhere you listen to podcasts and download each episode today. Welcome to Twyat, This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moresca, your guide through this big, giant world of the enterprise. But if I can't guide you by myself, I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field, starting with our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. He's a senior analyst at Omdia. Curtis, I am getting really excited about Black Hat. How's it going over on your side? Well, I'm also getting awfully excited about Black Hat and DEF CON. We have uh, definite uh, indication from the organizers that DEF CON is going to be a hybrid event this year. So there will be in-person components. I'm looking forward to being there for that. Black Hat as well is going to be hybrid. Uh, so lots to look forward to, lots to get excited about, um, and frankly, a lot to stay really healthy for. Indeed, indeed. Thanks for being here, Curtis. Well, speaking of exciting, we have Mr. Brian Chi, Net Architect at Sky Fiber. Now, Chibert's been giving me a lesson on what to do before you move into a new home. Chibert, uh, what's how's the prepping going on on your side? Well, I'll tell you, the amount of crud that came out of the ductwork in my new new home's HVAC system right. was really gross. But the I the bet stuff they use is really cool it's this machine and it has a rotary brush that they shove up into the pump into the uh, um the air ducts and it just scours the inside it's really cool i'm no, sounding I, I'm, so uh, geeky I'm about to, hvac now right <laughs> right right i was gonna say I was, i'm gonna have to do what you said and not put the uh networking cable up to the uh, hvac tunnels there so we'll have to figure out another another solution yep <laughs> Indeed. Cool. Well, thanks for being here, Chibert. Well, speaking of busy, we have quite the busy week in the enterprise for sure. Now, what if we say that organizations, the way to get them at their attention to patches and vulnerability is to actually hack them first? Well, how would you feel about that? Well, we'll definitely talk about that. Plus, Kubernetes doesn't inherently put enterprise issues at the center of its services, but the industry has responded. And today we have CTO replicated Mark Campbell take us through the innovation that's happening around containers, Kubernetes, DevOps, and a lot more. But before we get into all that goodness, let's go ahead and jump into this week's news blips. Now, like Curtis has said in the past, Solar Wings is the hack that keeps on giving. U.S. officials this week formally blamed Russia for backing one of the worst espionage hacks in recent U.S. history and imposed sanctions designed as punishments for that and other recent actions. In a joint advisory, the National Security Agency, FBI, and Cybersecurity and Information Security Agency said that Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service, abbreviated SVR, carried out the supply chain attack on customers 
network management software from Austin, Texas-based SolarWinds. Now, significant accusations, if you ask me here. Now, the operation infected SolarWinds software build and distribution system and used it to push backdoor updates to 18,000 customers. The hackers then sent follow-up payloads to about 10 U.S. federal agencies and about 100 private organizations. Besides a solar wind supply chain attack, the hackers also use password guessing and other techniques to breach networks. Now, the advisory said that the SVR-backed hackers are behind other recent campaigns targeting COVID-19 research and facilities, both by infecting them with malware known as both WellMess and WellMail and exploiting a critical vulnerability in the VM software. The advisory went on to say that the Russian intelligence service is continuing its campaign in part by targeting networks that have yet to patch one of the five following critical vulnerabilities, including that VMware flaw, the Fortinite Fortigate VPN, Cinecore Zimbra collaboration software, Pulse Secure Connect Secure VPN, Citrix application delivery controller and gateway, and VMware's Workspace One access. Now, meanwhile, the U.S. Treasury Department imposed sanctions to retaliate for what it said were aggressive and harmful activities by the government of Russia, Russian Federation. Now, the measures include new prohibitions on Russia's sovereign debt and sanctions on six Russian-based firms. The Treasury Department said supported the Russian intelligence services efforts to carry on malicious cyber activity against the United States. They were called out because they are an integral part and participant in the SVR executes operation. And, of course, Russian government officials have steadfastly denied an involvement in the SolarWinds campaign. Although overshadowed by the sanctions and the proper attribution to Russia, the most important takeaway for this announcement is the SVR campaign remains ongoing and is currently leveraging the exploits. Now, if there's any time to stay on top of your organization's traffic and disparate systems, this would definitely be one of them. Well, under the heading of you haven't been worrying about nearly enough stuff, a software developer has been arrested and booked in a computer sabotage case. A federal grand jury in Cleveland returned an indictment charging Davis Liu, 51, of Houston with one count of damaging protected computers. Officials say Liu was employed as a senior developer with an unnamed company based in Cleveland, when in August 2019, the company was the victim of a DOS attack when production servers crashed and employees were unable to access the servers. According to the indictment, an investigation found unauthorized code installed on the server, which caused that server to create an infinite loop and crash. Lou was asked to return his company-issued computer, and officials say that before he did that, he deleted encrypted volumes and attempted to delete Linux directories as well as two additional projects. He also allegedly searched the internet for information on how to escalate privileges, hide processes, and delete large folders and or files. I guess he had never heard about doing things in anonymous browser windows or using Tor. The company says it suffered a loss of at least $5,000 and Lou has not yet entered a plea. Well, the Communication Workers of America, CWA, union is lobbying state governments to regulate internet service providers as utilities. The CWA, which represents more than 150,000 workers at AT AT&T and over 30,000 at Verizon, announced on Monday a multi-state effort to pass state legislation that would establish Public Utility Commission oversight of broadband in public safety, network resilience, and consumer protection. Quote, legislation has already been introduced in California, Colorado, and New York, and the CWA is in active conversations with policymakers in state houses across the country about its model bill, the Broadband Resiliency, Public Safety, and Quality Act, according to the union. In addition to broadband regulation, the model bill calls for regulation of voice over internet protocol, home phone services offered by cable companies and other ISPs, which has replaced the old copper wired landlines for many consumers. 
The Federal Communications Commission is likely to restore Title II common carrier regulation of broadband providers and net neutrality rules after Democrats gain an FCC majority. But state-level regulation, similar to what's historically been applied to telephone service and other utilities, could provide additional protection for broadband consumers. States have always had a vital role to play in overseeing our communications networks and ensuring those networks are operated in the public interest. It's codified in the Communications Act of 1934. Gigi Sohn, a consumer advocate who served as counselor to then-chairman Tom Wheeler in the Obama area FCC, said in the CWA press release. Quote, unfortunately, many states abdicated that responsibility in the early part of the millennium at the behest of incumbent broadband providers. Now the COVID-19 pandemic has made abundantly clear that broadband is essentially infrastructure. It's time for states to take back that authority. I wholeheartedly support CWA's initiative to convince states to reassert their authority over broadband and voice over IP services. States should be able to protect consumers, ensuring that networks can withstand ever-increasing natural disasters and other threats to public safety and collect data about broadband pricing, deployment, adoption, and network resiliency, according to Sohn. I'm really not sure I agree with the entire article, but I do agree that deregulation has in too many cases failed the consumer. Perhaps a middle ground being set up by the FCC chair that isn't in the pocket of big carriers management might be the answer. Now, tech companies, trade groups, and industry-funded organizations are ramping up their criticism of the Protecting the Right to Organize Act. Now, the act could impact decades-old labor laws here. Now, it does empower unions and creates new penalties for companies that violate violate labor laws. Now, in return, it can be expanded and collect bargaining rights for hundreds of thousands of workers. Critically for Silicon Valley, the bill would pave the way for gig workers at companies such as Uber, DoorDash, and others to organize by giving these workers currently classified as contractors the status of employees for union organizing. Now, the bill was already passed the House. The President Biden's $2 trillion infrastructure and climate plan called for its passage. Now, union leaders Liberal Democrats and worker advocacy groups view the bill as a chance to stand up for the tech worker. Now, right now, if companies break the law, it's like a slap on the wrist. Now, that means companies can choose the dark path to correct the challenging situation. Now, the PRO Act would reverse course on that type of behavior. Corporations are arguing that the pandemic isn't the time to pass stricter labor laws, but they're running an aggressive campaign to portray the legislation as bad for business and potentially harmful for jobs. Now, the stakes are high for organized, organized labor, which sees the tech industry as the next frontier here. But there's been a growing surge of workers' activism at major tech companies, ranging from contractors like Uber drivers to top engineers walking out of Google. Now, typically, when legislation strikes the negative response from companies like this, it means a nerve's been hit and they might just be heading down the right path. Well, it's not just you. Bot operators have been feeling the pressure from the pandemic, too. Shifts in consumer activity due to the coronavirus pandemic altered the activity of bots in 2020, according to a new Imperva report. Healthcare and gambling sites saw notable increases in bots, both those labeled good and bad by Imperva. When bots accounted for 35% of traffic to healthcare sites, which was up from 21% in 2019, and 34% of traffic to gambling sites, up from 19% in 2019. Now, while bot traffic to healthcare sites climbed throughout the year, almost quadrupling by the end of 2020, both e-commerce and government sites saw a significant increase only in the last quarter. Some of this automated activity would likely be considered malicious by most observers, but hustlers who use automation to hoard in-demand items and gouge consumers, as well as cyber criminals who use bots to attempt credential-based attacks like credential stuffing or password spraying, are definitely bad bots that most would consider malicious. Imperva calls such bots, quote, the pandemic of the internet, end quote. The divide between good bots and bad bots is pretty fluid because most of the internet relies on bots. 
Search firms crawl websites to create indices and deliver results for specific queries. Other companies rely on scraping data from sites to offer consumer services. Now, while businesses may want to block the leak of such information, most other internet users would not consider these activities to be bad. However, from a business perspective, any activity that's not human is often considered bad. Antibot service provider Casada clarifies that, quote, if you're serving up traffic to bots, you're spending money on infrastructure, system tools, and personnel that you just shouldn't have to, end quote. The Rich Communication Services, RCS, rollout continues to be a hopeless disaster. A year and a half ago, the cellular carriers created Cross-Carrier Messaging Initiative, CCMI, a joint venture between AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, and Verizon, would roll out enhanced messaging to the masses in the year 2020. Now, Light Reading is reporting that that initiative is dead, meaning that the carriers have accomplished basically nothing on the RCS front in the past 18 months. RCS is a carrier-controlled GSMA standard introduced in 2008 as an upgrade for SMS, the ancient standard, for basic carrier messaging. SMS, which had its start back in 1992, has not kept up with the feature set of the -the over-the-top messaging services like WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and iMessage. And while RCS still wouldn't be able to keep up with services like those, it can bring slightly more messaging functionality to carrier messaging. RCS includes things like uh, typing indicators, presence information, read receipts, and location sharing. Verizon confirmed the news to Light Reading, saying, quote, the owners of the cross-carrier messaging initiative decided to end the joint venture effort. However, the owners remain committed to enhancing the messaging experience for customers, including growing the availability of RCS. Well, my opinion is that much of the problem is actually in competing standards between Apple and Google. Similar to the fight you normally find with the Internet Engineering Task Force working groups, it's always the big players fighting over whose standards to follow, while the actual engineering types try to bring enough middle ground that we actually get a standard, uh, which apparently didn't happen with RCS. Bummer. Now, the pandemic has had a lot of impact on the industry worldwide. Now, if you couple that with other factors, including environmental ones, parts of the industry are downright struggling. Now, you might have heard about how chip makers have been impacted, causing a shortage for mobile and PC device makers. However, as the year progresses, there may be another issue coming. The chip makers use lots of water to clean their factories and wafers and the thin slices of silicone that, were, that formed the basis of the chips. And worldwide, with semiconductor supplies already strained by surging demand for electronics, the added uncertainty about Taiwan's water supply is not likely to ease the concerns about the tech world's reliance on the island and on the chip maker in particular. Now, what's that chip maker? Well, more than 90% of the world's manufacturing capacity for the most advanced chips is in Taiwan and run by the company TSMC, which makes chips for Apple, Intel, and other big, pretty big names here. Now, last week, the company said that it would invest $100 billion over the next three years to increase capacity, which would likely further strengthen its co- commanding presence in the market. Now, TSMC says the drought has not affected the production thus far. But TMC, that they have also said that the facilities in the uh, Hinshu or Shinju uh, consumed 63,000 tons of water a day. It's a lot, according to the company. Now, more than 10% of that water supply actually comes from two local reservoirs. But with Taiwan's rainfall becoming no more predictable even as the tech industry grows, the island has to go to even greater and greater lengths to keep the water flowing. That means if you thought about your organization having trouble finding devices now, just wait until their drought is up the chips too. Well, folks, that does it for this week's blips. Next up, we have the great bites. But before we get to those bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech, and that's PlexTrack. Now, you may already know this, but managing your services and systems is really hard to do and making sure that they stay secure all the time as well. Well, PlexTrack is the security management platform that brings you better reports, deeper assessments, and more insights. 
Now, do you already spend hours and hours reporting security issues and feel like it's getting you nowhere? Well, that's really a hard problem, right? Are you buried in data but still can't get a full picture of your security posture to prioritize remediation effort? Well, we've got the solution for you. That's right. PlexTrack empowers continuous assessment, automated workflow, and effective collaboration between teams to help cybersecurity professionals do more in less time. Now, create assessment reports in half the time and centralize remediation efforts across all scans, assessments, and audits through a powerful risk visualizations, scanner and ticketing and integrations, and enhanced analytics to effectively communicate risks in real time. Now, whether you're red or blue, there is a Plex track for every security professional to save time and get the work done right. Now, red teams can actually import findings from numerous vulnerability scanners. They can also include screenshots and videos with auto formatting. They can create customized templates and export to Word with one click. And they can also streamline those reports by writing process to deliver better reports even faster. Now, blue teams can actually customize internal and external assessment questionnaires as well as synchronize findings with task management tools like Jira Cloud. They can assign findings to team members and track status over time, and they can provide attestation of security posture with robust analytics. Now, on April 12th, PlexTrack announced that they've closed a $10 million round to fuel growth of their cybersecurity workflow platform. The venture firm's Noro Mosley Partners and Madrona Venture Group led the round with participation from Stage.O Ventures. Now, PlexTrack will use the funds to continue building the team and growing the platform. PlexTrack improves the entire security engagement lifecycle by making it easy to generate security reports, deliver those securely, and track the issues to completion straight from the platform. Book a demo today. Try PlexTrack free for one month and see how it can change your life as a security professional. Simply go to PlexTrack.com slash twit and claim your free month. That's P-L-E-X-T-R-A-C dot com slash T-W-I-T. And we thank PlexTrack for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now time for this week's Bytes. And we have a couple good ones here. Now, sometimes it's not enough to tell those organizations that their systems and services are vulnerable. I definitely have worked with a lot of organizations where even if you warn them, they kind of sit on their hands for a while. There's plenty of those organizations out there that are warned and they just sit around for too long. Well, it's believed to be an unprecedented move by the FBI is trying to protect hundreds of companies like that and to be infected by the Hefnium hack. Now, how do they do this? Well, by hacking them itself using the original hacker's own tools. Well, the hack which affected tens of thousands of Microsoft Exchange server customers worldwide and triggered a whole, go- a, a whole of government response from the White House, reportedly left several back doors that could let any number of hackers right into those systems again. Now, the FBI has taken advantage to remotely delete themselves, an operation that agency is calling a success. The FBI conducted the removal by issuing command through the web shell to the server, which was designed to actually cause the server to delete only the web shell identified by its unique file path. Now, the FBI says that their owners patched thousands of systems before it began its remote Hafnium backdoor removal operation. Also, that it only removed one early hacking group's remaining web shells, which could have been used to maintain and escalate persistence on our authorized access to, new, to U.S. networks. It'll be interesting to see if this is a precedence, precedence for future responses to significant hacks like Hafnium. While I'm personally undecided here, it's easy to argue the FBI is doing a world of service by removing a threat like this one. Now, I want to get your guys' thoughts on this. You know, obviously, the FBI was doing good here. They're trying to do good. They're, they're, they're basically hacking the systems themselves to, to wipe, them, wipe the slate clean. But is this, uh, is this something that we want? What do you think, Curtis? Well, I think this is interesting from several perspectives. One, it kind of gets us into minority report territory. (laughs) You know, we know that this was a a bad, serious vulnerability. But if this is successful, what's to keep uh, the FBI or other parts of the government from saying, you know what? We're just going to, to make sure that no big systems are vulnerable from here on out. And while I know that the government does employ some very good IT professionals, are we sure that every patch that they would apply would 
not break some of the enterprise software deployed at wherever they're hacking. Um, you know, th this is one of those, those wild cases where should the owners of these systems have been patching? Absolutely. No question. They should have been doing it. Should the FBI then have gone in and done it for them? Uh, that's a much trickier thing. You know, this, this is similar to the arguments we get on why doesn't the government just go and hack back at the, the hackers who come in and attack citizens or servers that belong to U.S. corporations? There are a lot of good reasons for the failure to go on the offense. Um, I suspect that we may have just seen a line being crossed and in years to come, we're going to look back at this as the starting point for some uh, significant adventures in enterprise IT. Indeed, indeed. I think it's definitely something out of sci-fi for sure. And I think the the interesting part here is if companies and organizations really want that. What do you think, Chibert? Is this something that you know organizations are going to want or are they just going to mistake in this as another breach? Well, you know, first off, can the FBI please patch my WordPress site for me? <laughs> Hmm? Yep. You know, this reminds me of this conversation that we had with um, a whole bunch of uh, local businesses, shall we say. And the conversation was, war driving should be wiped out. It's, it's bad. People are exposing um, our Wi-Fi networks. And, I, and my reply back, and this was actually with a whole bunch of law enforcement in the same room. I said, well, you know what? My favorite trick used to be going in, finding those open and unsecured networks, especially in um, sensitive areas, finding a printer, sending it, you know, patching their Wi-Fi routers, changing, you know, making it secure, and then sending them instructions on how to get back into their system onto one of their network printers. Now, obviously, this was a fantasy, right? And uh, I think this is kind of the same thing. Well, I was reminded by the FBI that such a thing was illegal. I was going into someone else's system uh, without their permission, and technically, I was breaking the law. And I said, well, what laws were I breaking? Um, they couldn't really tell me. So things have changed a little bit. Obviously, the shoe is on the other foot. I think this is a interesting way of approaching it. Uh, it's obviously a really nasty hack and could potentially um, wreak havoc across industries. Now, did, should it be done? Could it be done? Yeah. Um, I think if a corporation is or organization let's call it organization has not paid attention even if people you know say yeah uh, you guys really need to patch like right now and they don't do it maybe it's time we give the organizations like the fbi just a little bit more rope and let's go and fix the really bad um problems um to prevent them from escalating um only time will tell. And this is going to be one heck of a, um interesting story to follow because I am absolutely sure someone like the ACLU or I don't know, someone else like that is going to jump in and start making all kinds of noise. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. <laughs> I am as well. I, Curtis, I want to throw this to you because, you know, is this legal? Like, is this legal for the FBI to do that? And if so, is it, or if not, if it's at least covered under the good faith? Because if you think about it, we can almost blanket this slightly under the fact that there's a lot of software companies out there. A lot of them have auto updates and a lot of them will install things on your machine to, uh, to repair some things, some, for some security holes. Uh, can this be blanketed on something like that? Or is this, this is just a breach of, of confidence, a breach of network. Well, I'd like to think that when Microsoft or Apple or anyone else pushes an update that applies itself automatically, it's because at some point the owner of the system has given permission for that to happen. 
you know, there was a, a, a point in the installation or at some point when they had to click a checkbox somewhere to say, yes, this is okay with me. That obviously was not the case here, although reading about it, the FBI says that they did try to contact the server owners to let them know that things were going wrong, that they had a vulnerability and that it would be patched for them. Now, the FBI also got permission from a judge, the equivalent of a warrant, to do this. <clears throat> that gives them a layer of legal protection. But I think you're right. I suspect that this is the sort of thing where we're going to see it be litigated. Uh, someone, whether one of the uh, companies that was affected or uh, a trade organization is going to file suit just to get uh, higher courts to come in and weigh in on the legality of this. It's going to be very interesting. It's uh, because while there are some who would say that it's the equivalent of the beat cop noticing that your store's front door was unlocked at midnight and just reaching in, turning the, the lock and closing the door, there are others who would say that this is closer to the equivalent of uh, the local beat cop just showing up in your bedroom to tuck you in at night because he thought you were cold. Um, <laughs> we'll see what courts say about this, but I doubt we've heard the last of this particular set of updates. I agree. I agree. You know, I'd like to to attribute this to one of my favorite movies out there, Sneakers. How they used to, you know, drop in and, uh, you know, fight the bad guys or, or show the security vulnerabilities and get paid for it. But, you know, in the same sense, at least the corporations knew what they were paying for. We'll see how this goes in the future. Well, folks, that does it for the bites. Next up is my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. But before we do that, we do have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Melissa. Now, have you ever forgotten to check the date on the on a carton of milk? I know I have because, you know, it's easy to store it away and just forget about it. And like milk, your customer data can also go bad. Now, sometimes even faster than milk. Now, put it into perspective, up to 30% of customer data goes bad each year. Now, think about all your customer base that's that you have. That's a lot of customers. Now, that's where Melissa is there. For you. And Melissa, make sure your data is accurate and current so you reach the right customers at the right time. Their tools have helped businesses maintain fresh data for over 35 years. That's why over 10,000 businesses trust the address experts. Now, with Melissa, you can validate existing customer data and find new customers. Stop wasting time and money dealing with inaccurate customer data. Get accurate data that helps you to know your customers better. Now, you can Verify addresses, emails, phone numbers, and names in real time with Melissa. And Melissa's global address verification service verifies addresses for 240 more and more countries and territories at the point of entry. Now, are you tired of having duplicate customer information in the database? Well, with Melissa's data matching, you can eliminate clutter and duplicates and increase accuracy of the database and reduce postage and mailing costs. Now, customers don't always give you enough information. Get the information that completes the customer's profiles better and more thoroughly. Add customer demographic information to your records, such as property data, marital status, and social media handles. Now, Melissa's flexible deployment options offer different platforms to suit any preference, business size, or budget. With flexible on-premise web service, secure FTP processing, and software as a service delivery options, choose the best way to meet your unique business needs. The Melissa continually undergoes independent security audits to reinforce their commitment to data, security, privacy, and compliance requirements. Plus, if your organization is worried about compliance, Melissa's SOC 2, HIPAA, and GDPR compliant. And Melissa's supporting communities and qualifying essential workers during COVID-19. See if your organization qualifies for six months of free service by applying online. Don't put up with sour customer data. Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log on, sign up, and start playing in the API sandbox 24-7. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. That's melissa.com slash twit. And we thank Melissa with our support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now time for my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight, right? And today we have CTO replicated Mark Campbell. Welcome to the show, Mark. 
It was great to be here. So, you know, obviously our audience loves to hear people's origin stories. You have a really good one. Can you maybe take us through your origin story and maybe just a small, quick journey through tech and what brought you to Replicated? Sure. Happy to. So I started out my career um, originally as a sysadmin network admin, not as a computer programmer. Um, I went to school and studied computer science um, and, and learned how to write code. But my first job was actually installing servers in networks, um, driving around the state of Michigan at the time, um, installing network servers, Cisco routers, programming them um, and, you know, all kinds of crazy environments. Some of them were, you know, one, ones that are fun to think about. Um, working in were like in these state prisons. We were going around and installing these air gap networks inside building schools inside the prisons running, you know, network in Cisco and all this different hardware. Um, eventually that got a little bit um, monotonous, boring maybe. Um, and I decided like, I want to actually like stop installing networks and I'm going to actually go like create a product, go write, write code. And I switched and I became a computer programmer. Um, and my first job professionally writing code was for um, Wendy's, the fast food service, you know, the fast food company. Um, and I wrote the first credit card processing system that their point of sales use inside the the restaurants. And it's crazy to think back in the day that like, you know, they didn't all take credit cards. It, it was like they were one of the first fast food um, restaurants to start taking credit cards that easily. So all kinds of unique technical challenges there um, and went through that um, and eventually ended up working for, you know, a startup um, writing code. I was the founding engineer of a, a startup out here in, in, in L.A. called Tiger Text um, and got to build some really fun um, messaging uh, app and tech, uh, like client and server, um, which led me and my co-founder to start a company um, probably uh, nine years ago now called Look.io. And what we were building at the time was a an SDK for mobile apps for iOS and Android for live chat. So one of our first customers was Hotel Tonight, and they could just take the SDK, drop it into their app, and if their customer was having a problem, you know, you're on your, your iPhone and you're having a problem booking a hotel room or checking in, you could just tap a button and it would overlay a live chat interface right on top of the, the, the app. Um, it was, it was a, the, my first startup. Um, it was nine months from the first line of code that we wrote until it got acquired by LivePerson. Um, which was, you know, they had like the patent on live chat. And so, you know, quickly thrown into the world of enterprise tech, you know, we had this app, we were a startup and now it's a pub, we're part of a publicly traded company um, selling our product, just slap their logo on top of it and selling our product out to larger and larger enterprises and having to deal with like the fun of enterprise tech. So we were there for a couple of years. Um, and then uh, during that time, got more and more into DevOps infrastructure, Docker, um, containers, um, eventually Kubernetes, and created the company that we have now, Replicated, where we're going to talk a lot more about that, I'm sure, but we're really focused on delivering enterprise uh, software behind the firewall, specifically using Kubernetes. Yeah, I think the, one of the interesting part, you talked a lot about, you know, a lot of services and systems in the back end. Now, if you kind of look back, uh, you know, in retrospect, you know, we talk a lot about microservices and how they, we can scale those better and, you know, using Docker and Kubernetes. Um, would you have done anything different? Would you have, you know, used microservices? Would you have used Docker and containers in those type of situations? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, it, it getting mainstream and being adopted by more accepted by more enterprise enterprises running in production. It's, it's been incredible. It's been a, like a really fast journey too. you know, it was when we were at live person, not that long ago, Docker had just come out before Kubernetes, you know, the, the, the idea of like breaking down the monolith into microservices in order to allow each individual team of developers to really own their code in production. The, the, the big DevOps movement where, you know, you know, developers don't write code and throw it over the wall to let somebody else deploy. Um, developers just own that part of the stack all the way through. And, you know, that, that, is, is really like made a lot stronger with um, microservices and, and containers. Right. I think one of the challenges we see, I mean, obviously Kubernetes and, and Docker and then Kubernetes coming along um, is helping organizations. But one thing we're, we actually see is that average, K Kubernetes inherently is not really built for the enterprise. Enterprise has a lot of, you know, special requirements that it has. What are you seeing the industry industry doing to adapt it to help it work for them? Yeah, I mean, all kinds of things. I think that's the the real power of Kubernetes is that it's it's this common API. You know, Kubernetes can do a lot of different things for different folks. You know, originally it was really about bin packing and in, in, in cost reduction so that you could run multi like large workloads in production without having to have as many different services. And then it became about scaling services. 
um, in, in all different use cases. But one of the things that we really see a lot of value to the enterprise is around the common API to deliver software. You know, I can write software and I'm running it on in my multi-tenant SaaS service inside um, AWS, but the enterprise can now has access to this common API, which has kind of created this, this natural like like suite of integrations, this entire ecosystem of CNCF and non-CNCF projects that integrate in and bridge like their requirements for security into Kubernetes. You know, there's tools like Open Policy Agent, which allow them to ensure that they're they're able to run, you know, like containers that meet their security requirements. There's container registries that have all these enterprise integrations in, so they can still meet their minimum requirements. They still meet the, those those rules and like the the policies, the the compliance that they have, but in a Kubernetes, in a or really in a container world now. Now you bring, you bring up a good point because obviously a lot of these organizations they could go and they can customize it and they can get it to work for their different policies or the security models. But is is there is there a really high barrier of entry there? Or do they is there solutions out there that can help them get there faster? Yeah, for sure. There's definitely solutions out there to get them faster. Um, you know, like I think like if you look at Kubernetes, there's like two different things that you should think about. One is first party code. You know, if you want to just your team is writing code and you want to ship it to Kubernetes, um, you know, you want to take get rid of a bunch of EC2 instances or bare metal um, VMs and run it on, on Kubernetes. Um, you can do that with all kinds of stuff. All, all the cloud providers today have managed Kubernetes offerings. There's all these add ons that can run inside Kubernetes from, you know, like CNCF and non-CNCF projects that really dig in to look at, you know, all the different enterprise requirements. You can build CI CD workflows around it. Now we have had to kind of recreate a lot of those processes in a, in a Kubernetes world in order to get Kubernetes native. But, you know, you're used to Jenkins, Jenkins can still run inside Kubernetes. So you can, you know, or deploy to Kubernetes. So you can still do that. And the other side is really, you know, the part that, you know, we focus on are replicated, which is consuming third party applications inside that cluster and making sure those third party applications can meet your 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 requirements. Right. Yeah, I think that that's one of the interesting things that I'm seeing is a lot of organizations, they go and they 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 have they want to be compliant, they want to be secure, they want to keep their data private. Uh, but they they really have a challenge of figuring out, well, obviously I have these different microservices and now I'm deploying them to different containers and how do they communicate together and how do I deploy updates to them efficiently and securely and you know obviously they're not storing any data but they're interacting with the back end. You know, so there's a lots of questions that they're trying to trying to figure out and they're again trying to migrate some older systems to that model. That's where I wanted to go is how hmm. organizations migrating to that model uh, and how are they doing it efficiently? Yeah. Um, so for, for, there's lots of different ways that they can do it in Kubernetes. You know, the, 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 one of the things that Kubernetes really opens up is the application doesn't have to be built specifically for it. Like the platform, you can push a lot of that complexity, a lot of that functionality down to the platform. And you see it with, you know, service meshes like Linkerd and, and, and Istio and, and other service meshes where you can start to put in, um, that level of, you know, I, hey, I have this like monolithic application. It's written in, in, in Java. It's running on the JVM and I can't, I'm going to work on breaking it down into microservices. But in the meantime, I want to throw it into Kubernetes and I want to like, I want to take advantage of the platform services that Kubernetes offers while I'm breaking it down so that I can handle that as, as an iterative, um, you know, my migration to it, it doesn't have to be a very waterfall approach in order to, to tear that application apart, take up, you know, six months or more of engineering effort in order to, to, to finish it. Well, when we come back, I do want to bring my co-host back in because we have lots of questions to ask here. And obviously organizations are taking advantage of a lot of this uh, as they move to the cloud. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week at Enterprise Tech, and that's Technology Powers X, an original podcast by Dell Technologies. Now, each episode of Technology Powers X focuses on a different industry and goes behind the scenes to help you understand how technology is reshaping business everywhere. Now, I got a sneak peek of Technology Powers X recently, and suppose you're like me and you're you're a roller coaster buff. While well, you get to know how the technology behind it and gets that best ride of your life, well, you need to check out episode two, where Danielle Applestone talks about today's roller coasters and how they're powered by complex algorithms. They actually capture real time data, measure stresses, monitor speeds, and provide predictive maintenance. Well, it's pretty interesting if you ask me. Well, all the episodes of Technology Powers X are captivating. And interesting. Now, a recent episode features researchers who are studying the architecture of the human brain in an effort to develop a more versatile AI model. Now, another episode explores the world of professional esports, featuring a behind the scenes look at Team Liquid and their star CSGO player, Allege. And one episode talks about how vertical farming and how innovative new tech 
can change where our food comes from and how this may be the future of sustainable feeding the 21st century population. Now, Technology Powers X is hosted by Daniel Applestone, a hardware engineer and entrepreneur. Now, if you are a pet lover, check out episode 14, The Best Partner for Pets. Here's a clip. Yet today, technology plays a growing role, not just in happy reunions, but as an invaluable tool to America's animal welfare workers. Search for Technology Powers X anywhere you listen to podcasts and download each episode today. That's Technology Powers X. Download it today. My thanks to Technology Powers X for their support of This Week and Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, let's get back to the grindstone here. We have CTO of Replicated, Mark Campbell here. I want to do want to bring my co-host back in, though. I want to bring uh, Kurt first. Kurt? I appreciate that. I was uh, making some notes here on things to talk about. And one of them that I'm really interested in is the idea of what deploying in Kubernetes or really deploying containers of any sort does to the complexity of managing your enterprise application infrastructure. I mean, the, with the idea that containers are entities that can be created and destroyed even more cavalierly than virtual machines, it seems to me that this could make for a very compli complicated uh, application management situation. Is that the truth or are there things that Kubernetes does that simplify management? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, you, you definitely would think that, but you know, in, in our experience, Kubernetes in running containers actually has the opposite effect. It does simplify uh, con management of the applications. First, because you, you, you build it knowing you're gonna deploy into an application that's gonna restart and reschedule and move containers around. And so, you know, the, the bar is just higher to get the application in. So you know you're gonna be deployed into an environment like that. Um, and then second, you know, the complexity always existed. Everybody had to handle that, but if you were deploying you know, 10, 20, 100 different applications into your environment and into your infrastructure, you would have 10, 20, or 100 different ways to manage all that complexity. And with Kubernetes, now you have one, you have the platform layer, and you can now have a platform team who's responsible for, um, you know, not managing the applications, but ensuring that, that, that there's a consistent way to manage all of those applications across it, which just helps you scale because you have common APIs and kind of common ground that you can build off of. All right. And you were talking earlier about uh, CI, CD, and we often see containers and Kubernetes in the context of DevOps and the, these other uh, sort of agile adjacent uh, methodologies. The question is, must Kubernetes always be used within one of these disciplines or is it broader or is it the case that a company that's not already invested in DevOps or CI CD would never even think about moving to a, a container based architecture? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, it, it should be used in a CI CD environment, but I think everybody should be adopting that or have that on their, 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 their radar. Um, I think one of the, the things about Kubernetes today is, you know, you know, you don't have to adopt all of it. Like Kubernetes, you know, you, you bring it up and a lot of people talk about it. It's a really complex technology, um, but it's, it's only complex if you try to adopt every aspect of it to do everything. You know, you can absolutely start really small with Kubernetes, you know, find the thing that you actually you benefit from. Um, and if, if you don't want, you know, blue green deployments and, you know, deploying, you know, if you're not ready yet to deploy a thousand times a day, you don't have to in order to like see the value out of having Kubernetes. You can start seeing some of the, the, the benefits of having a common way to deploy, to deploy software. All right. Well, we've heard about Kubernetes for a while and it, it really is growing rapidly within the marketplace. So I've got a question that, that lets you look up forward a little bit. Um, has Kubernetes at this point developed enough weight in both the market and the minds of 
uh, operations professionals that nothing else is going to come along to replace it. I mean, is Kubernetes the ultimate technology for deploying and managing containerized applications or is there room, is there the possibility for further development in the future? So I, I think that there's there's room to build on top of Kubernetes. Um, I think Kubernetes has, has clearly won uh, like the container scheduling and orchestration, you know, war if there was one. Uh, just recently, I think it was last week or the week before, Mesos, which was, you know, another leading uh, container scheduling orchestration was officially end of life and put into the Apache attic. Uh, you know, the team at, at have, have adopted Kubernetes over there too at Mesosphere, D2IQ. Um, Kubernetes is definitely the standard now to deploy software. Um, that said, Kubernetes is is complicated, um, and Kubernetes, it's it. Not everybody needs to be interfacing with the Kubernetes API. There's there's great like solutions that can be built on top of Kubernetes that create more of a of a platform layer that you could actually run on, where that you have a team who can manage Kubernetes, um, you know, and you're actually deploying containers or serverless type workloads on top of it, all powered by Kubernetes. Because I, yeah, I do think Kubernetes has is the is the standard today. Well, I think what I'd like to do is have you take a step back, you know, take a microfiber cloth to that crystal ball that you seem to have in your back pocket. Kubernetes is a great platform. We we're pretty much in agreement on that, but it's not perfect. If you could wave a magic wand and say, let's go and do the next iteration what would you like to have in Kubernetes to make it better? That's a great question. Um, so Kubernetes is, is um, you know, it, it, it does everything for everyone. And I think, you know, we're, we're entering a world now, a few years ago, you know, people would be a little bit concerned about running stateful workloads on Kubernetes. And, you know, I think that that's more and more like accepted today. Um, I think, you know, just more adoption of Kubernetes, you know, like there's a next generation of a lot of services coming out that you see, you know, traditionally you had Postgres and MySQL as, as databases that folks would use. And now there's a the container native, you know, horizontally distributed uh, services that are coming out around, you know, Vitesse and TyDB and CockroachDB um, and other like, you know, kind of born in the cloud native ecosystem, born in the cloud native era uh, databases. And where I'm going with that is I think like the, 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 the thing that Kubernetes is going to keep pushing on is the extensibility of it. There's a concept in Kubernetes called operators today, which allow a developer who's writing an application to really extend the Kubernetes API and allow the application to be managed by Kubernetes itself, not just as a platform, but managed by Kubernetes. And then you, you, you keep going, taking that farther and you get into a world of you know, autonomous operations and self-healing software. So if I want to run Postgres or I want to run a database inside my cluster, I don't have to understand, you know, the, the 100 or the 1000 different configuration options and how they all work together. But I just let the system run. I just deploy it and I say, here's the desired state. I want a database that runs and handles all the traffic that I want to be able to push into it. And then the system runs and like Kubernetes is the API server internally can, can take that and continue to, to, uh, to, to ensure that it, it, my desired state, which is I want a database to run, continues to be true. So it sounds like you have put some thought into this. Replicated has some interesting approaches to how you deal with Kubernetes. Um, I would say on-prem in the cloud and so forth. What kinds of things does Replicated bring to the table to make Kubernetes better? Sure. So what we really do is we say you're a SaaS company in, or you're a software company and you're shipping your software, you're using Kubernetes today, but you have customers who want to run it in, in an on-prem. Um, and I want to use like air quotes around that on-prem because it doesn't have to mean traditional rack and stack server sitting in a server closet. A lot of on-prem is just somebody else's AWS or Azure or GCP account. It's who has access to those servers. And when you think, you know, at first glance, you're going to say, oh, I've written Kubernetes applications. Um, I can just ship these manifests or these Helm charts, which is a Kubernetes packaging format to my customers and they can just run them. 
But when you actually get down into it, you realize there's a lot of stuff that's missing when you want to ship your software to for somebody else to operate. You know, you need to think about how you're going to license it. How are you going to ensure that the environment meets the minimum requirements? How are you going to update it? You know, some some customers run it in their own environment because they want to run it in completely disconnected, air-gapped systems. And so, how are you going to update those? And you know, you know, software does break sometimes. Environments are uh, challenging. Um, so you're running this in a hostile, what you know, what we like to call a hostile environment. And how are you going to troubleshoot it when it breaks and and and, and get it fixed again and give the power to the customer to to remediate it? So those are like the layers that Replicated provides. We provide, you know, licensing for your application so that you can ensure that, you know, if the customer decides they're not going to use it anymore, it doesn't can continue to work, or you can enforce some kind of constraints or entitlements on it. Um, we provide pre-flight checks if they have some servers or a Kubernetes cluster that they want to run your application on. You can before they start to run it and then get, you know, down deep into the installation and something fails and you have to troubleshoot it. You can just ensure that it meets a bunch of minimum requirements from you know, basic stuff like memory, CPU, disk IOPS, um, but like a lot more specific, you know, like, uh, hey, this the external database that they provide has to have a, be a minimum requirement or have a certain schema. Um, and then we do, you know, troubleshooting. So if something's broken, how do you, you know, avoid the, you, you, are, you as the software engineer are not going to have access to that customer's cluster to troubleshoot it. And you don't want to have like a multi-day long asynchronous back and forth to troubleshoot it, asking them to send you a log, they have to grab the log, redact sensitive information from it, send it to you, which takes you to the next you know, step of the troubleshooting. So we we have a tool called Troubleshoot. It's all open source. It allows you to you know, package up, codify in a, in a YAML file what, um, how to troubleshoot, what, all the data to collect, all the commands to run, all the logs to collect. Your customer can um, codify into their, all their remediation, or sorry, all their, um, all their uh, uh, redaction capabilities so that all the sensitive information like passwords, IP addresses, anything like that is, is deleted and re replaced in that bundle. And then you can even package like, you know, analysis in so that they can, uh, instead of a bunch of log files, which are still going to be really difficult to grok and to, to, to go all the way through, they can say, oh, you know, we know that this is running on this type of an environment with this container runtime and this showed up in a log. So therefore, here's a link to an article that's going to help the end customer troubleshoot it. And the last thing that we do is um, not all customers today have Kubernetes clusters. So you might be, you know, a, a, a leading you know, forward thinking SaaS company and you want to ship your application to your customers, but you know, some enterprises haven't yet fully adopted Kubernetes. They will, um, but they haven't yet. So we have a package called curl um, with a K um, and it's like your Kubernetes URL. So you can actually embed Kubernetes right into your distribution. So the customer can just bring along, you know, some Linux machines and run, run a bash command and they get, they get your application up and Kubernetes is then packaged kind of as an implementation detail in that. You know, we don't really hide it from them, but they don't have to bring a ton of Kubernetes expertise in order to to get the application up and running. Now, I don't want to talk about the last one really quick because that sounds intriguing to me. What what do you do when it comes to obviously these software ch change quite often because they're open source? Uh, is this their your own kind of packaged version of Kubernetes, or is it the uh, the public version? And does it get all the updates and so on? Yeah, no, it gets all the updates. It's not our pack, our own package version. Curl isn't really a Kubernetes distribution as much as it's a Kubernetes distribution creator that we allow anybody to be able to access. We, we just package kubeadm, which that is like the the entry main Kubernetes distribution that Kubernetes supports, um, and then a bunch of add-ons. So you can have you know what container runtime, whether it's Docker or Container D, you know what ingress do you want, nginx ingress or or another ingress that you want. Um, do you need a Docker registry, include Prometheus, anything like this that you need to package, it's going to be delivered as part of the platform. You can pin those to specific versions, or you can just say, keep it updated to the latest version. And then we we allow the customer to really easily install it um, or download a tar gzip file that's cryptographically signed and everything, because software supply chain is super important um, in this world. Um, and then they can, they can verify that the integrity of it, and then um, run it in a air, totally disconnected air gap environment. So if they just have some servers that are, they, they can't reach out to the internet even during install time, they can just, you know, sneak your net or however they can get this one archive into that environment and then execute it. And they get a full Kubernetes cluster up and running with whatever packages that you had. Um, and then, you know, our job at, at Replicated is to make sure that, you know, the latest version of Kubernetes is automatically available in there. So, you know, customers can either auto update or they can, um, 
they can manually download it if they need to for their, their type of an infrastructure or their environment. Makes sense. So the, the air gap solution is interesting to me because we worked, I've worked with a lot of organizations that work in government clouds and they're developing software and deploying it there. So this kind of like self contained package is intriguing. Do you see a lot of organizations using this type of model when they are deploying to something like a government cloud and updating a government cloud software service? Yeah, for sure we do. I think that that's one of, you know, the, that's definitely a compelling reason to, to use like replicated um, just because we can package your application and the cluster completely as air gap disconnected environments. There are, you know, there, there's GovCloud, um, there's a limited set of services in it. There's other, you know, you know, ways that you can get software running, but, you know, the, generally speaking, you have to really think totally offline. You have to bring all the dependencies along with it. And, you know, in those environments, they're, they're, they also have, you know, a whole different set of rules too. Not just they can't reach out to the internet, but they're going to have, you know, likely not the bleeding edge newest version of, you know, Linux sitting on those machines. You're going to have kind of restrictive firewall rules and things like this that you have to ensure that your your software is compatible with. So air, air gap, you know, our, the air gap environments are are definitely tricky environments to to deploy to, and it's a, been a big part of what we focused on. Now, let me ask you, I mean, this is the obligatory question that we ask a lot of organiz- a lot of companies that have, you know, that kind of step into the technologies where it's just pretty hot. Now, there are some competitors out there. What is Replicated doing that that's different than them? Sure. Um, I think what, what Replicated does that's different, um, first of all, our, our biggest competitor is just, just like building it yourself. You know, you can t- like take a Helm chart and you can package it and you can ship it to end customers. You know, the, the advantage that we have is we've been doing this for almost seven years now, and we're deployed in many, over half of the Fortune 100, have replicated apps up and running in them, and we've seen a lot. And whenever we run into some weird configuration or a weird environment, we'll bake that back into the product so that the next customer doesn't have it. Like our goal is to really say, you're gonna ship into this next enterprise customer or government agency or whoever it is, and they're gonna have a set of unknown problems that you haven't even thought about yet, and traditionally, the way you build around and solve for those problems is run into them, figure out what the problem is, and then go build for it. And so Replicated has this like little bit of a network effect and in, in the platform capabilities really ensure that, you know, what we've seen on different application installations is going to benefit you for your next installation. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, unfortunately, we're running a little low on time. Mark, I want to give you a chance to maybe tell the folks at home where they can go to learn more about Replicated and maybe how to get started. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, obviously our website's replicated.com. Um, our Twitter handle's on the screen here, but um, our main product is COTS, um, K-O-T-S, Kubernetes off-the-shelf software. And so I encourage anybody to either go to Replicated or check out COTS, K-O-T-S dot I-O. Fantastic. Thanks again for being here. Well, folks, you've done it again. You've come to another hour, the end of another hour, the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. So tune your podcatcher to Twyat. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-host, starting with our very own Mr. Brian Chi. Brian, what's going on for you in the coming weeks and where can people find you? Yeah, you know, it's it's exciting. I'm I'm moving into a new house and we're trying to get it all ready and our uh Household goods arrive next week. Yay. But anyway, uh, we're still going to be doing all kinds of stuff on online. And uh, for Twitter, I'm ADV, N-E-T-L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab. But you know what? If you want to drop me a line directly and you don't want it public, that's fine. I'm Chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T at twit.tv. But you know what? You can also send it to twiet, T-W-I-E-T, at twit.tv, and that hits all the hosts. Uh, We would love to hear from you. We've had some spectacular show ideas from our uh, viewers. And hi, chat room. And we want to hear from you. So give us a drop us a line. Give us a yell. Talk to us. We'd love to hear more from you. Thank you, Chibri. We also have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming week and where can people find you and all your work? Well, I'm actually working on a big research project where we're going to be looking at uh, enterprise security management uh, later on in the year. We've got a big project coming up that way. Also working on a project, I'm working on the vulnerability management 
uh, component of a DevSecOps uh, project that we've got going. Just had my first report published over at Omdia, one on dashboards. Got a lot more coming up. Uh, I'm enjoying the opportunity to uh, go out and do some research, talk to a lot of interesting co uh, companies. And if there's something that you would love to hear about, see about, drop me a line. You can send me a direct message on Twitter at KG4GWA, or you can drop an email to twiet at twit.com. I will see that along with all the other hosts and can work what you would like to know about into my research planning. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you guys for being here. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch and listen to our show to get your enterprise goodness. We want to make it easy for you to watch and listen and catch up on your enterprise news. Go to our show page right now, twit.tv, twit.tv slash twit. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information, the guest information, and the links of the stories we do during the show. But more importantly, next to those videos, you'll get those helpful Download and subscribe links. That's right. Support the show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice. Listen on any one of your devices or any one of your podcatcher applications because we're on all of them. Definitely subscribe. It's the best way to stay on top of your enterprise and IT news as well as the best way to support our show. Now, after you subscribe, you can, pre you can press your friends, your family members, your coworkers with the gift of Twy because we talk about a lot of fun topics on this show and I guarantee they will find them fun as well. Now, if you already subscribed and you're available on 1.30 p.m. Pacific time on Fridays, we do this show live. That's right. Live right now on the stream at live.twit.tv. There you can come out, come see how the pizza's made, the behind the scenes, all the fun stuff that we do here on Twit. And as well as you can also join the chat room as well because we have a really great set of characters in there. IRC.twit.tv. That's right. We have a great set of characters that are giving us content giving us questions, showing us support. Thank you, guys. And, of course, uh, you know, it's great conversations in there. So check that out, irc.twit.tv. Now, if you can't watch the show live, you've already subscribed, but you still want to be part of the amazing conversations and the community, that's okay. We have a really great community out there that's 24-7 discussion th discussing things at twit.community. That's right, a really great website out there that you know, the community is having great content discussions, host discussions, guests, uh, technology discussions. Go check it out. It's 24-7. Remember, you can always follow me at twitter.com slash LouMM. There I post all my enterprise tidbits, questions, and comments to you, people like you, of course. And also I post some of the things I do during my normal work week at Microsoft. You can check some of that stuff out at developers.microsoft.com slash office. There I post the latest and greatest ways to customize your office experience and make it more productive for you. I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support this week in Enterprise Tech each and every week. We thank you for all their support and all their help. We couldn't do the show without them. I also want to thank all the engineers and staff at Twit. And also, thank you again to Mr. Brian Chi. He's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer. He does all the show bookings and the plannings for the show. We really couldn't do the show without him. So thank you again, Chibert, for all your support. And before we sign out, we have to thank our editor for today, Mr. Victor, and of course, our TD and Really great host on the Twit Network as well, Mr. Ant Pruitt. Ant, what's going on for you in the coming weeks here on Twit? Well, still making some great content with my show, Hands On Photography. Uh, Ashley, go check out this week's show as I do a little bit of eye popping portraiture work there. As you see right there on the screen, twit.tv slash hop. Go check it out. Thanks for the love. Thank you, Ant. And until next time, I'm Louis Moresca just reminding you. If you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that podcast episode. If you would like to check out more about tech news, then you should check out Tech News Weekly with me, Micah Sargent, my co-host, Jason Howell, where we interview the people making and breaking the tech news every week.